I'm Teresa Caveney, the Executive Director of Sustainable Farming Association of Minnesota. Uh, welcome to the first opening workshop of SFA's 31st annual co conference. When we celebrated our 30th a year ago, none of us anticipated anything such as a pandemic, but I am proud of the way my colleagues and our board and members have adapted and pivoted. And we hope that this entire week of webinars and Zoom meetings is fruitful and fun and productive. Uh, I wanna first thank our sponsors and our lead sponsor for this session is Compeer. Compeer has really supported SFA over the years and they have expressly dedicated funds for beginning farmers, emerging farmers, as you heard. Uh, I don't know if Sai Tao is on the panel today, or I should say on the uh, program today, but he has been a marvelous resource for people who really want to begin farming and who want to innovate and do value added. So we encourage people to go to Compeer if you live in the area that is served by them. Uh, this first webinar, uh, which deals with silvopasture, is coordinated by Tyler Carlson, and Tyler is our silvopasture and agroforestry lead, and I will turn it over to him, and I will also just say Jared Lumen is going to be fielding questions. Please put them in either the chat or the Q&A. Tyler, take it away. Okay, yeah, thanks everyone. Welcome again to SFA's annual conference and today's webinar on silvopasture economics. Um, today's webinar is, let's see, this is gonna work. There we go, yeah. Today's webinar is uh, funded in part by two grants, um, one from the North Central Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Professional Development Program and the other um, from our grant promoting and restoring oak savanna using civil pasture through the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. Um, SFA receives technical support on these grants from the University of Minnesota Extension, as well as the Savannah Institute. Um, over the past year, our programming has taken a look at civil pasture as both an historical and modern practice around the world in North America and here in Minnesota. A core component of SFA's current grant funded work is looking at the potential of restoring oak savanna grasslands via the application of civil pastoral principles, practices, and techniques. We've covered the basics of civil pasture and its application and begun to form a community of practitioners and researchers via the civil pasture learning network. Last summer, we held several training field days. We have generated several fact sheets and resource documents and captured both our online and in-person programming. So if you've missed some of these conversations and or resources, these documents, webinars, podcasts, and virtual field days can be found on SFA's Silvo Pasture and Agroforestry webpage. These conversations are generating a lot of interest both from producers and resource professionals who already have experience with Silvo Pasture, as well as many who are interested in implementing such systems for the first time. For producers considering adoption, it is helpful to understand the financial considerations associated with civil pasture systems. So that will be our focus for today's session. After our presentations today, we will have an opportunity for a discussion with the presenters. As your questions come up, please post them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen, and we will come back to those at the close of the presentations. Um, today we have two presenters. Um, Dr. Ashley Conway is Assistant Research Professor at the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry, and Dr. Joseph Orifice is Lecturer and Director of Forest and Agricultural Operations at the Forest School at the Yale School of the Environment. Um, today, uh, Dr. Conway will start us off with her presentation. Dr. Conway is, um, her focus is to provide research and outreach leadership to a civil pasture program focused on understanding forage tree livestock interactions in the Midwest US. She has a PhD in animal science from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Prior to her PhD, she obtained an MS and BS in animal science at Washington State University. 
She also worked from 2010 to 2012 as an agroforestry and sustainable agriculture extension volunteer in Zambia, Africa with the US Peace Corps. Ashley grew up on a small family farm located in Camas, Washington State. The farm is a family managed herd of dairy goats for grade A raw and pasteurized milk and artisan creamery. They also maintain a small flock of wool sheep, chickens and bees, cultivated commercial blueberries, lavender and vegetables. We're thrilled to have Dr. Conway back with us after starting us off on last spring's webinar series with a look at silvopasture from a global and historical perspective. Welcome back, Dr. Conway, and thanks for joining us today and helping us again advance uh, our work and our conversation on silvopasture. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate that introduction. So I, I don't know about all of you. It's wonderful to see so many people participating from all over. Um, we're in a bit of a cold snap here in Missouri. So if my internet connection becomes unstable, um, just give me a minute and I will, I'll have to set up a hotspot on my phone. So I appreciate everybody's patience. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this afternoon. Excellent. I will also keep my video off for that same reason. We'll save a little bit of bandwidth here. So um, as Tyler said, my name is Ashley Conway. I am originally from Washington State, but I reside here now in Columbia, Missouri. And I'm with the Center for Agroforestry, um, particularly focused on civil pasture research. So I was hired about um, a year and a half ago, and the focus of my position as yet has really been to build a civil pasture research program essentially from scratch. The center has had um, really wonderful researchers in the past conduct civil pasture research and experiments. Um, but my position is fairly, it's new in the sense that there really hasn't been a faculty member exclusively looking and developing a civil pasture research program. So as I've been here and getting settled in, um, obviously COVID has caused a few roadblocks and challenges, but um, I've been really pleased with how the last year and a half or so has gone since I got here in building um, excuse me, a research program in, in Missouri and then regionally, how to apply that regionally. So uh, I won't get too far into that because really the, what we're here to talk about today is really economics. And I, I mentioned this only as the caveat that a lot of this research takes time. And so a lot of the data, that, well, entirely the data that I'm presenting, I haven't personally conducted yet. I haven't had that opportunity, but it is a focus of my future research and the projects that I'm currently working on to assess economics, because as we all know, we're here, it's such a moving target, but it's arguably one of the more critical questions that producers have. How can I do this and be like make money and be economically sustainable? What is this going to do for my operation? What can I expect? So hopefully over the course of this, um, over, of this webinar, we'll be able to kind of answer a few questions hopefully, and not leave you with too many more. Um, so I'm going to start off with, this is sort of what I call my stump speech, uh, these first couple of slides, just to get everybody on the same page if, if we're not too familiar with silvopasture. So silvopasture is one of um, the five commonly accepted agroforestry practices here in the United States. And I think now officially there's six. I need to um, probably read up on that for sure. But we're adding, we're looking at for the most part, these five agroforestry practices. Um, we've got windbreaks, forest farming, riparian buffers, alley cropping, and then civil pasture systems. Um, this is sort of my own breakdown. This isn't an official <laughs> designation, and certainly these are, these are arguable designations, but I like to think of these as being ordered here with windbreaks being kind of the, the least complex type of agroforestry practice. And civil pasture here being at the bottom as a three tier system, it's, I think it's arguably the most complex agroforestry practice to implement. Um, and that's because it includes these, these three components that all work together. Um, civil pasture is the intentional and integrated management of livestock and forage and trees all working together. Now, it seems like a very simple equation when you put it out like that, but really it can be extremely complex because every time you add an additional component of management, you're exponentially increasing the type of management effort and, and, and interactions that you can have between these different components. Um, it's one of the things that makes it the most challenging, but I think it's what also makes it at the same time the most flexible. I, I call it a la carte agriculture. So, you know, the, the principle is pretty basic, but you can really 
select which components to include with what works best for what you have in, in your system. So um, the, the tree component can be a tree that will offer timber, specialty crops like fruits and nuts, animal habitat um, that will incorporate windbreak and fodder for your, um, your pasture or your, your, your space. The forage itself can be any combination of cool warm season grasses, introduced natives, legumes, brassicas, et cetera. Um, and then the, the livestock can really be any, any of, run the gambit really. So cattle, you can have sheep and goats, you can have pigs, poultry, pollinators. So whatever you end up selecting with what works best in your system, um, these all work together. And it seems like a fairly straightforward, um, let me check, just check in the chat box, make sure I'm still good here. It seems like a fairly straightforward thing. Um, let's see, I'm having trouble advancing my slides here. It ends up being a very complex um, interaction. There we go. Um, it, which, which, which is sort of more of a web instead of this, this simple like three dimensional um, directional flow. All any, whatever you end up selecting will have an unpredictable impact or interaction with, with something that somebody else might be doing in the sense that it makes, it makes predicting and offering recommendations very difficult because if one person plants a civil pasture system with exactly the same forages and trees, but does poultry instead of goats, the what happens to the soil and how much gain and growth and profit you end up getting really changes. It entirely changes. So it makes it hard to offer um, and then do research. But despite it being challenging to kind of pin down, it is, it's an important system to consider. So in addition to agroforestry practices and silvo pasture practices being rooted in indigenous land management practices from across the world, they're really coming to the forefront now for very critical and urgent reasons. So um, this, I've, I've pulled this chart from the IPC IPCC special report that was put out in 2019. Um, if you look here on the left, um, agroforestry, the blue box indicates a large potential to mitigate some of the effects of climate change and combat desertification, land degradation, while also simultaneously enhancing food security. So ignore the letters, um, it's a different designation, but the dark blue boxes end up being the highest potential Light blue is sort of a medium potential. This almost white blue is even less and a red ends up being a negative. So it ends up actually costing more in that particular area. So all of these different categories, mitigation, adaptation, certification, land degradation and food security, agroforestry across the board, we have dark blue boxes, improved cropland management, almost all across the board, dark blue boxes with a medium blue box, improved livestock management. We see a lot of potential here improved grazing land management. I would say down here, we've got medium and dark blue boxes again. Um, forest land management down here, we have dark blue and medium blue boxes. Overall, obviously there's some um, variation in what we're seeing, but agroforestry and civil pasture as a land management practice. So ways to enhance forest management or land management, grazing management, um, which I think can fit in several of these categories here that the IPCC has broken out. These have really, really bent like potential for mitigating a lot of the challenges that we are currently facing and will continue to face in the future. So I think that's, that's one of the primary reasons why it's really coming around to the forefront of our, of our conversation in agriculture again. Um, how can we modify our current food production and land management practices to mitigate um, these climate these climate challenges. So it is, you know, these these practices, like I said, are rooted in indigenous land management. They're, they're not new practices. However, with our modern agriculture system, the question really becomes: How do we implement it in the current modern context? How do we take a lot of these old principles and make them, you know? feasible in this day and age? What does that look like, you know, in, in an environment, in an area where we're, we have 
we have a legacy on our land of colonialism, what that looks like for our forests and pastures and soil. Um, and then in the current global political context, what is, what, how can we make this work for ourselves? Um, ultimately, I think that's probably what brought you all here is that you want to learn a little bit more. How do we do this? You know, what does this look like? Um, so I, I bring this up because in my mind, um, and I think there is a, there's a bit of a scale, but really civil pasture can kind of go in two different directions. So we're talking about establishing trees into an open pasture, what I call planted or plantation style civil pasture. Um, or a woodland conversion. So taking some unmanaged woodlands or forests that are probably very degraded um, and, and then managing them in such a way where you can improve the actual ecosystem by thinning them out, by incorporating livestock strategically and creating a, a woodland silvo pasture. Um, again, this big question, how do we do it? Well, I wish we had specific answers for everybody's questions because like I mentioned earlier, because civil pasture can look like so many different things, it's really hard to nail down a specific strategy to get to this point. You know, where, what is your plan? What can you do on your land to, to have a successful civil pasture system? Well, that answer is gonna be different for every single person, unfortunately, but we still would like to kind of come down on some, some common themes what civil pasture does look like and what it definitely doesn't look like. So I always include this slide because I think it's so important. And I'm pretty sure that Joe is gonna also talk about this because um, we never get tired of saying this, that civil pasture is not the same as unmanaged woodland grazing. Um, there is without a doubt this hesitation of incorporating livestock back into woodlands um, and back into forested places because it can go very terribly wrong. Um, and there is no doubt that livestock have an impact on the land, however you manage them. So, so it really is about mitigating that. And that can only happen with intentional and strategic management. So this is a picture of a meadow um, that's part of a forest ecosystem where cattle have been grazed. Uh, we see here a truly sacrificed lot <laughs> for these, these poor cattle um, and these poor trees. So I've incorporated these statistics here from Garrett uh, Jean Garrett published these. It, they're, they're a little bit outdated now, um, but uh, I think it's, there's, there, it's really sort of the most recent frame of reference we have, I think, for Midwest civil pasture and woodland grazing. How, what are people doing here in the Midwest with their cattle and their woods? So they estimated that 34% of the Midwest forested farmland is grazed. So forested farmland would be pastures with edges or um, basically cattle in woodlands that are also incorporated into a farming system. Uh, forest land, however, so strictly forest spaces that don't have any pasture component associated is really much less. So it's only 6.6%. 6 .6%. But when we're talking about civil pasture and potential conversion, this is, this is more of what we're talking about. And that's still, a, that's a pretty hefty chunk. That's a third of the farmland that is already being grazed, potentially in a, in a detrimental non silvo pasture way. So I think we have some work to do. Um, and there's, there's definitely um, Midwest in this sense. Um, I can't remember exactly what states were incorporated in this Midwest designation, but I'm sure that many of you have, um, have seen these, these spaces either on your own property or your neighboring land where you've got a pasture and then you have maybe 10, 10 acres of fringe area around the side that's maybe the cattle are in there, maybe they're not in there because they've been excluded. <laughs> um, the question really becomes, what do we do with that? Can we make that land productive without reaching this really sad, degraded state? Um, Ultimately, that's a conversation I think for another webinar, but we just, I think it's always important to emphasize that just because cattle are let into your woods or your woodlands or your forest does not mean that it's silvo pasture. Um, when we do manage our land, um, silvo pasture can do some pretty, pretty spectacular things. So this is just my, um, a, a brief rundown of some of my favorite literature bits that kind of hit the highlights of what benefits can be seen with silvo pasture. Um, <clears throat> this is a 2006 paper by Rob Kallenbach. Um, this was actually done here in Missouri out at HARC at our 
um, agroforestry research station that we have about a half hour away from where we are. And uh, it was a, a loblolly pine and white oak, um, I believe white oak, silvopasture that was replicated. And um, they found that there was lower biomass of the forage. There just wasn't as much forage, but heifers that were grazed in these paddocks ended up having equivalent gains. So um, the, the performance ended up being exactly the same and they did not suffer any negative consequences from being grazed under trees. Uh, Brugler all in 2005 indicated that integrating trees and pasture positively altered the botanical composition of that pasture, indicating there's, there's effects, potential effects on biodiversity um, that are pretty positive. Um, again, this is, this is a little bit old, but I do love this because a lot of this is rooted a lot of the foundation in, in the agroforestry research from the timber side. Um, Classen et al. Um, in 1999 found that forage management uh, in a silvo pasture system actually improved the, the pine growth, the pine timber growth in production of the trees that are managed in a silvo pasture, as opposed to ungrazed timber um, and or just managed without livestock. And they found that the system was financially competitive with the ungrazed timber as well. So this is this is an incident where we see um, that adding livestock to the system and managing the forage underneath those trees also helps improve the tree component of the system. Hill and others in 2008 saw um, between a 20 and 39% increase in soil organic carbon compared to open pasture. Um, this, again, we have a lot of conversation these days revolving around sequestration and carbon cycling and carbon credits. And again, I think that's a, that's a webinar for another day, but we do see that in agroforestry and silvopasture pasture systems, there's incredible potential to um, sequester organic carbon in the soil. Um, Obviously, that's, that is an, it's a, a simple take on a really nuanced topic, but overall, this is a snapshot of some of the benefits that we can see in certain types of silo pasture systems. <clears throat> so, since we are talking about economics today, as opposed to other aspects of silo pasture, I kind of wanted to come back to this idea of in a silo pasture system, where is the value located? Like, when we manage a system with livestock and trees and forage together, where are we seeing the benefits economically? Where is that coming from? And it, it comes from several different places. I think it kind of starts at the tree itself, to be honest. So we see value in the microclimate that trees can provide. Um, what I have, what I didn't include in the slide before with the forage conversation, oftentimes in the literature, we see that under in shaded systems and silvo pasture systems, because the trees are um, shading, they're providing a little bit more shade, the forage doesn't grow as much. Like we saw, there's reduced biomass, but we do see an increase in the quality of the forage. So um, higher crude protein, more digestible in its fiber, particularly for ruminants, which is the hypothesis of why we don't really see any loss in gain, even though there's less biomass. In an open pasture system, typically biomass is directly related to gain. It's almost a direct correlation. Um, the more that the animals can eat of a high quality forage, the more that they'll gain. Um, with a shaded system, we see that we can sort of lose a little bit of biomass and the animals won't lose any performance because we're actually increasing the quality uh, of the forage. And, and a lot of that is due to this, this microclimate effect of the trees. Um, so then that ends up feeding into, because of the microclimate and producing potentially a higher quality forage, that end up, ends up directly relating to increased gain and or yield, depending on what we're talking about with livestock, um, whether that's pounds of gain or milk produced. Um, we, we see that realized in saleable product through the animal. Um, secondly, the trees could also be in adding value to the livestock by offering shade. Um, and potentially additional fodder. So depending on the type of tree, you could have added nutritional resources for the, for the animal. If, if we just even look at this traditionally and think of the shade that's offered by growing trees to the livestock, we see an improvement in performance because of reduced heat stress. 
Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the other slide. So we almost, we, it's like a double whammy what the tree is doing to increase the value of the livestock product. And then as we were talking before previously, the livestock and the forage management end up feeding back oftentimes, or at least in, in, in some cases, improving the quality of the timber being produced of the tree. So we have a greater uh, quality timber product. We're increasing the value of the tree um, because we're grazing under there. So it feeds back and we have saleable product in the form of timber and or fruit and nuts. So all of these things considered, you can see increased value from civil pasture systems in several different ways. And a lot of this boils down to just the multiple revenue streams that are offered as opposed to a single um, enterprise system where you're just grazing cattle or you're just planting trees. But they do, again, interact with each other. Um, so again, I want to, I want to dial in on this really and look at where is the value in a civil pasture system. Um, we see value realized from increased livestock performance due to the increase in forage quality and the shade itself. Um, and then increased value of saleable tree products, um, such as improved timber value. There is also this question mark, then just the nature of the system. How do you measure resilience? How do you measure the value of biodiversity? How do you measure the soil health benefits that you might be incurring um, because you're managing this system um, in, a, in a more um, integrated way? Those are questions that I think that we're still trying to answer and kind of pin down. And, and arguably, I think they're probably ones that people are more interested to know, at least myself, I could be I'll be interested to hear what if anybody has thoughts on this during the panel. <laughs> what what type of value are you more concerned with? Um, so I'm going to briefly I have to hail back to my roots because I am an animal scientist. I kind of want to dial in on this integrated value thing. So this is this is an energy diagram of how nutrition, when consumed by the animal, energy wise, is partitioned out. So very briefly, we, an animal will take a bite and we have a gross amount of energy, the entire amount of energy that that uh, bite of forage can offer. Um, it's broken down into what is um, used for digestion, what's utilized for metabolism. When all of these um, costs, if you will, for all of these, these bodily functions, such as creating feces, uh, creating gas and urine, just a heat of metabolism, just metabolizing causes heat, when all these costs are accounted for, we have net energy. And then what's left over is partitioned out in for maintenance and production. So maintenance energy is everything that you need to just keep your body going if you sit around and do nothing. Production is anything that you might need to go above and beyond what your maintenance energy is. So, um, oh no, well, I did have a a graphic of this last part here. So if you, if you, if you stay with me, we have just um, the maintenance being partitioned out and production being partitioned out. This is really where um, when, when you're raising livestock, what you feed them ends up being, where that feed ends up going and being realized between maintenance and production. And the value that we're seeing in uh, civil pasture systems is is coming down to how that energy is being partitioned out. And um, to emphasize this, that the, it's important to understand that nutrients are prioritized in the body and energy rolls downhill. Now, obviously, this is it's a bit of a simplification because that we're consuming more than just energy when we graze forages. We've got protein, we've got fiber, et cetera. But for the most part, if we're talking about just calories, and you can, you can think about this in the way your own body works too. You have a basal metabolic rate. And then if you're wanting to gain weight for some reason, then um, although I think more often it happens the other way around, anything above your required daily amount of calories ends up being added to your body weight. And it's pretty much the same way with animals. So the way that civil pasture systems add value from an energy standpoint is that we're minimizing the maintenance requirements through shade as well as increasing the energy towards production by providing a more digestible forage. So if you think back here, by reducing the amount of maintenance requirement through reducing heat stress, so heat stress costs energy, 
your body is expending calories to cool yourself down. You're not spending that energy towards producing milk or growing meat and gaining. Um, so the higher your maintenance requirement is, the less energy you have for production. So it's a twofold impact when we're talking about silvopasture. pasture. Um, not only can you reduce your maintenance requirements by providing shade for the animal, that's also going to be, um, you're also providing more energy on top of that for a more digestible forage and increasing your production. All this to say, it doesn't necessarily have to happen in a double whammy. So this is an and or situation. Just providing shade can be enough to improve your, your animal performance or just providing, you know, if your trees aren't quite tall enough to cast a lot of shade, but they're tall enough to really impact your forage, you're still gonna see some improved performance through digestible forage. It's a continuum. Um, so we're just kind of talking about potential in this case, where you can potentially see increased value. Um, so I have a few case studies that I won't spend too much time on. Um, like I said, this, none of this is my data per se. So I'm just sort of articulating ways that we can see this potential. This is a paper, a fairly new paper that was published in 2019 where uh, heifers, heifers were allowed to graze into fight infected tall fescue. Now, when we're talking about shade, if you're further south, like where I am in Missouri, um, tall fescue is a bit of an issue. And it's a big question, can we improve performance um, and, and mitigate all of this fescue pasture with shade? So, and, and if you're not familiar with the issue of tall fescue, if it's into fight infected, um, it's sort of a toxin for, for ruminant livestock particularly, and it can increase susceptibility to heat stress. So there's a real desire for producers who have a, a vast amount of tall fescue pasture if it's indified infected to come up with strategies to improve gains and um, in some cases that looks like offering shade. So um, in, in these two experiments that they report, the, the heifers are fed silage or pasture and they have natural or artificial shade. In this, in this experiment, natural shade were trees and artificial shade was a uh, shade cloth. And then there was a second experiment where the heifers were also grazed with the shade, but they were given, they were supplemented with either grain or feather meal. So the, the bottom line, what I really want to focus in on is that in experiment one, um, the natural shade that was offered through the trees resulted in greater body weight gains of the heifers. Um, we have 0.86 pounds a day versus 0.64 pounds a day. In experiment two, again, heifers with natural shade, so the trees had greater weight gain, again, by, uh, and these were statistically significant. Additionally, in this experiment too, they did calculate the cost of gain um, and for natural shade provided by trees, the cost of gain was lower than the artificial shade. Now, some of this could be just because of the cost of establishing an artificial shade structure is, um, can be pretty expensive up front, but arguably also establishing trees. And you also have to wait a, a period of time before those trees grow tall enough to cast shade. Um, ultimately, the, the emphasis here is that you see improved performance and um, a return on investment with um, providing natural shade, any amount of shade, arguably, um, in a tall fescue pasture. But uh, trees, um, I, would, I would go with trees over an artificial shade structure based on those numbers. Um, and then moving quickly through a couple of case studies, these are, these are data that the Center of, for Agroforestry has conducted, but this was before my time. So I am shamelessly borrowing this data from Dr. Larry Godsey's slides uh, from a few years ago. Uh, this is a case study done at the Williams farm. Um, the, this farmer had seven acres divided into two paddocks and he planted Eastern black walnut in 97 and they were grafted in, in 80, uh, 77, excuse me and grafted in, in 1980 and grazed them as part of a rotational grazing system. Um, he wanted to adopt silvopasture pasture because he had a personal interest in particularly producing a specialty crop, which was the black walnut as also, uh, and as well as uh, um, black walnut timber uh, for the timber market. Um, also increased pasture rental income. So several opportunities to increase your revenue stream here. Uh, this is just a screenshot of where he had planted them on his farm. We have two different areas. 
and some beautiful pictures of how these plantations end up looking in um, the height of their lush pasture season. Um, this was a great example of a planted civil pasture system and, and planting these trees into an open space and managing the forage for uh, timber and specialty crop products. So the economic analysis that Dr. Godsey uh, did with uh, Farmer Williams is that we see some additional income opportunities by renting out the pasture to his neighbor, rented it out at 35 to $40 per acre, and saw a 40 to 60% increase over the standard pasture rental rates of $25 per acre, presumably because these, these pastures offered shade. As a livestock producer, that's a huge opportunity. Um, and people had a willingness to pay much more for that pasture. Additionally, he made quite a bit uh, from the black walnut markets over the years, um, $1,200 a year, $150 a year for the nut meat. And then we've got a huller, sold the nuts to a local nut huller from 87 to present at about $50 a year. So we have multiple additional revenue streams that continually provide and offset some of these costs um, as the trees are grown. The cost to establish this civil pasture was about $762 an acre. His annual maintenance costs were about $65 an acre. And we see the net present value of the civil pasture when calculated at 6% um, ends up being about $2,631 an acre. So when you look at that in context of what the net present value of just that open pasture was by adding the trees, um, we go from $385 up to $2,600 an acre. So that civil pasture was extremely valuable. That's a rate of return of 12%. <coughs> excuse me, and a um, B to C ratio of 4.21. So this is a benefit to cost ratio. Anything over one it indicates an increase of benefits to the cost. So almost four times the benefit um, economically to establish these trees in um, into pasture and over a long period of time. I mean, we're talking, this was, this, this research was done um, some about 10 years ago now, but those trees have been growing since 1977. So it does take some time um, to get to this point. Um, and again, I won't, I won't spend too much time on this because I think this is probably more of what Dr. Rufache is going to talk about this. We have some, some civil pasture paddocks down at our WordAC Research Center. In 2002, um, Dusty Walter did his PhD work thinning out these woodlands and underplanting and then grazing. So from 2002 to 2005, we get, went from this um, overgrown, not much understory. We've got some woody, shrubby, scrubby things in here to um, a pretty wonderful looking civil pasture here that was able to sustain some cattle grazing in the in the summertime. This cost to establish at the research site was about $1,200 an acre, um, but this does incorporate some costs that maybe the normal producer wouldn't necessarily incur. So, um, and again, I'm sure we'll hear more of this later. Based on Dusty's research, the recommended cost to establish this type of civil pasture is about $390 an acre. There's cost to commercially thin the trees, um, clearing and site preparation. We see quite a bit of difference between what they actually incurred and what they estimate would be incurred. Soil amendments, um, establishing and planting the, the pasture, and then water and fence. What isn't measured in this study is the gain of the livestock. So livestock performance wasn't measured. So over time, this is a question, how much value would you realize when you gain um, through gain when you graze cattle in these in these pastures on a long term basis. So I, I'll, I'll kind of wrap this up here. <clears throat> I have some final thoughts and we can definitely talk about this more in the plan in the panel. Um, your costs for civil pasture are really going to depend on what resources are available. And it's a bit of a cop out, but really the, the true answer for anything economic is that it depends. Um, the value is a direct function of whatever you can have for saleable product, as well as improved system functionality through civil pasture. And again, we come back to this question of how are intangible benefits measured. Um, civil pasture offers a lot of opportunity for economic diversification, and it may seem sort of, you know, grabbing $50 here and there, but over time that can really add up. 
So ultimately, planning and flexibility, I think, are the key to long-term success. And this is really just my way of saying hope for the best, but plan for the worst, you know, and, uh, and you can go from there. So that's sort of my, um, that's what I have right now. And I'm really eager to, to talk questions later after, after our next speaker. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Conway. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your presentation there. And um, we will, we will have the conversation at the end of our next presentation. Um, so our, um, our, our second and final presentation today is from Dr. Joseph Orefice, who serves as a lecturer and director of forest and agricultural operations at the Forest School at the Yale School of the Environment. He teaches courses in agroforestry and forest management, and he also oversees forestry operations and applied educational opportunities on the 10,880-acre Yale School forest system. His research focus is in temperate agroforestry and applied forest management. Joe's most recent work has been in maple syrup production systems and temperate silvopasture. His passion outside of academia is farming, where he integrates agroforestry practices into Hidden Blossom Farm, which he owns and operates in Union, Connecticut. Okay, Dr. Uh, Orefice, whenever you're ready. Great, thanks, Tyler. Um, yeah, I'm glad to follow up um, Ashley's presentation. It really, uh, really nice, and uh, yeah, I'll try to. Uh, add some context here. I'm not going to go too far into all of the um, benefits of civil pasture and whatnot, but I'll go through some of the main topics here, try to stay on time. Because um, I know I, um, there's a number of questions that came in and I want to get to those are great questions. Uh, so forest conversion to civil pasture, I'm going to talk about the economics of it, but I'm really going to stay around this realm of, uh, well, what if we convert a forest to a civil pasture? What does that mean? Uh, there's quite a bit out there, you know, one of the first things I'll talk about is wooded livestock paddocks. Ashley did a nice job talking about this, you know, just putting animals in the woods, the troubles with that. Um, I'll mention civil pastures as a sustainable management strategy, give some, um, and then give some ideas on, on that if we're actually going to convert a forest, how that, how that happens. So, um, so Woodland Pastures, publication that was just on the previous slide, was put together a number of years ago from the 2012 agri Census of Agriculture. And uh, in my neck of the woods in Northeast, uh, we have quite a bit of forest land that is being grazed. And to give you an idea, Ashley showed some, some numbers on um, forest land on farms that's being grazed. This is looking at of the land in pasture per state, what percentage of that is silvo pasture or woodland pasture? We don't really know which one it is, um, but we can get some idea of it from these numbers. If we look at Connecticut where, I am, where I'm calling in from, 29% of the pasture in Connecticut, farmers are describing as woodland pasture. And yet of the thousand farms that um, said they had woodland pasture, only 24 of those farms said that they were um, practicing silvopasture or alley cropping. So you can imagine that likely much of this woodland pasture is probably not silvo pasture. It's probably what um, Ashley gave an image of and I'll give you some more images of. Uh, looking at Minnesota specifically, uh, I did some back of the envelope calculations yesterday and pulled some data from uh, the National Agricultural Statistics Service on the 2017 Census of Agriculture. In Minnesota, there's um, a million, about a million and a half acres of total pasture land. Non-woodland pasture, um, is about 1.2 million of those. And then woodland pasture, so what farmers are identifying as woodland pasture is 345,000. Um, that's 22%. So in Minnesota, 22% of the land that farmers are saying is pasture land, 22% of it is what farmers are calling woodland pasture. Um, we don't know if that's, I don't know if that's silvo pasture or if it's not. My guess is most of it is probably not silvo pasture. Most of it is probably just people fencing out areas of the woods on their farm, giving that, giving livestock access to that area um, for the purpose primarily of shade. You know, I like to call these areas feedlots with trees because they're fenced in areas with trees where cattle are placed to um, be fed 
and defecate. And, and they really cause a lot of problems because the amount of shade from the trees prevent grasses to grow. Um, and they, they can really lead to some serious tree health problems. They're not, it's not great for the animals other than they're getting some shade. And um, it's definitely not a good thing for the soil. So here's another example of that. Um, you know, I call it wooded livestock paddocks, wooden grazing. There really aren't a lot of a lot of specific names for this. I really like feedlots with trees, um, but you know, the root compaction, girdling, degradation, potential parasite problems. All of these issues are similar to issues that you have when you have continuous grazing. So it's not that animals and trees don't go well together. It's that if you're going to put animals in a system with trees it's complex and you need to think about managing that whole system. And what we see in these images I just showed you is a, is a part of the silvopasture system that's non-existent. And that part is forage, grasses. And that's what happens when we put animals in a place where there's too much shade from trees to grow grass. Here's another example of it. Um, so the under yielding of the total system, less feed for your animals, right? There's nothing for them to eat here. So they're, they're going to seek out roots um, or if they're, if they're cattle, they're gonna be seeking out leaves and maybe even stripping bark and cows and goats and sheep. Um, and you get a real problem here because anything that wants to grow dies out and then the trees are still surviving based on their, they're just barely getting by. And so they're still providing that shade. So you get a real quick loss of soil health um, and a likely significant loss in, in soil carbon as well. Not to mention the loss of carbon sequestration from having healthy trees that are growing um, and healthy forages that are growing. So, so why do people do this, right? Because why would you just put animals in an area where you have to bring them feed and you're gonna do damage to the soil? Why would you do it for shade? Okay, and this is looking at a shade structure, a portable shade structure on the left. And I've, I've seen these range anywhere from like $1,500 to $15,000, um, these shade structures. So they're expensive. You're gonna pull them around your field. There's labor to that. You know, farmers just really aren't using them all that often. Um, and so trees are another option. And one of the things I liked about this photo at a, at a grazing uh, event was they parked the shade structure next to the tree and both were providing shade to the animals. The animals didn't tell us which ones they preferred. I don't think the animals really care, shade is shade, um, but the trees have a lot of other benefits. So silvopasture, you know, we've already defined this in the presentation today, so I'm not gonna go through it, but you have three components, livestock, trees, and forage. All three of them need to be there for it to be a functioning system. Uh, some definitive characteristics of silvopasture, management of the livestock, timing, uh, you, you're maintaining forage health and tree health. So livestock are being managed so that your forage is healthy and your trees are healthy. And then your trees are actively cultivated. So you're growing the trees for some purpose. Um, in this case, this is a really neat silvopasture system. This is the Montado system in Portugal, where these are cork oak trees where the cork is harvested periodically every nine years and then livestock are grazed um, under that system. So I'm not saying this is appropriate to Minnesota, but it gives you an idea of how trees are cultivated forages are maintained and livestock are managed. Uh, in this case, livestock, livestock are managed through fencing. So all kinds of benefits here, you know, we're, we're talking about the economics and I'm gonna show you some, some uh, comparisons, financial analysis comparisons, but one of the really valuable things of silvopasture, I, in my opinion, financially, is this high quality forage and the summer slump forage availability. So anybody who's grazing treeless pastures knows that midsummer you run into a situation where your forage isn't producing as much because it's rather dry. And the forage that is there is likely, may have gone to seed, may not be growing back quite as fast. Um, and so maybe low quality. And in a silvo pasture, because of the shade, because of the reduced moisture stress on the forages, you typically in temperate, I'm speaking temperate regions, like where we are in the Northeast and likely where you all are in Minnesota, um, you can get higher quality forage under those trees and in the midsummer. And that's because the forage develops a little bit slower under the trees because of the shade, um, which makes it go to seed later, which means it holds its quality longer. And also because um, those trees are shading the forage to some degree, not a complete amount of shade, but partial shade. So that way those trees 
uh, that forage uh, isn't seeing that midday hot summer sun and it's still able to photosynthesize. There's also potentially some nitrogen dynamics that are helping that forage be more um, efficient in its moisture use. Um, and so we're thinking forest conversion, you know, like what, what makes sense, right? What makes sense to convert a forest to silvopasture? And you got to remember, if you're taking a, a healthy closed canopy forest, kind of like what you see on the right of the image here, and you're turning that to a silvopasture, well, you're really taking a system that, that's functioning fairly well. This one has some issues with deer browse in it, but in, in terms of regeneration of trees. Um, but overall, the trees are healthy, you know, the soil's functioning, you have all these different um, native plants in there, you're going to take that system and you're going to convert it to a pasture with some trees in it by thinning out trees. That probably isn't going to be the best thing for carbon sequestration, right? You're probably going to have a net loss in carbon sequestration. Um, and you're probably going to lose some, some native species biodiversity in there. It may still be appropriate because that's what, you know, the farmer needs to do or it's a, it's a piece of land that, that could get converted that way. So I'm not trying to villainize anybody for doing that. But from, from an ecological perspective, I think it makes more sense to, or it's an easier justification when you have a forest like the one on the left here. This is, this is a forest, actually both of these are from my own, my own farm, but this one on the left is um, an area where it was woodland grazed for, for decades in the mid 1900s. And the cows in there, the, the dry cows, ate everything but the barberry and the, and the physical trees. And so what persisted? The barberry. And so it took over. Um, and so this is an area where converting it to a silvopasture, to me, I don't worry as much about the ecological impact because the ecological impact is already being dominated by this non-native invasive shrub. So converting this to a silvopasture, thinning out some trees, killing the barberry, uh, getting grasses established, letting livestock eat it. Yeah, it's not the native system on this hillside, but it's a lot better than a forest with an understory of a shrub that can't regenerate um, on its own. So in this case, I think silvopasture from a forest conversion can make a lot of sense. Um, you know, there's a, there's a comment about indigenous use in lands. Uh, this, this is not gonna be in line with the indigenous use of the land, neither, neither scenario, because I'm putting cattle on a landscape that, that never in, in this part of the country never had uh, large ung ungulates like that. So even though this, this area, which is now forested, uh, likely pre-European settlement was, was um, cleared because it, um, it, was, uh, it was a hillside that was likely burned and, and the old records of it from the 1600s provide information that this was an area with grassland and some trees. So I'd kind of be returning the structure, right? but not necessarily the management. What we're doing, in, in my opinion, is something really new. Um, so competition and controlling the disturbance regime is key. If you're gonna get grasses to grow under a forest canopy, you need to think about controlling that disturbance regime because you could do all the right things. You could thin out the trees, you could get rid of the invasive shrubs. Um, you can make sure you can graze it enough so the brush doesn't come back up. But if you don't have forages established, you're gonna be out of luck. And so there's an opportunity to get forages established and then graze it regularly, periodically, to change the disturbance regime to favor forages. Um, in the process of conversion, it, it looks like I lost some of my text here, but um, in the process of conversion, you can use a forest mulcher. And so we're seeing um, forest mulchers on a skid steer here. If you have a lot of brush that you need to clear, all this low shade, all this low brush can really inhibit a lot of forage. So it's not always that you have to remove the biggest trees. It's often that you have to remove a lot of the smaller, lower quality trees because they're gonna provide the most shade. Um, so those can work. Another thing is if you have a closed canopy forest, you might get into a whole tree harvesting situation. These can be expensive. Um, I mean, you're looking at about $1,000 per acre. Uh, these, by the way, I can't really give you a great estimate on this because it, um, it depends on your land. These could range anywhere from, uh, like $1,000 a day to um, a couple thousand dollars a week, depending on what you're doing. But, uh, you know, whole tree harvesting is a nice way to go. If you can have someone come and cut the whole tree top and all, pull it out, take the saw logs, sell the saw logs, and then chip the tops uh, for, for biofuel or bioenergy, 
that, that could be a really nice way to go to convert a forest. Um, I wouldn't want to do that year after year after year after year after year. Um, but a one-time operation can get all that, all those tops out and really make this situation nice. So one of the things I did on my old farm in New York was I looked into this idea of, well, what if we take a closed canopy forest and we convert it to a silvo pasture, or if we just thin out the trees. So that's what I called a, a, a woodlot, um, even though it wasn't really what you would do in a woodlot, it was just thinning the trees, or an open pasture. So I cut all the trees and just converted it to a pasture, which is what some farmers in that region of Northern New York were doing. Um, so the three treatments, the woodlot was still thinned, uh, very heavy thinning, uh, silvo pasture, open pasture, meaning we cut everything and then um, seeded it, grazed it. So the pastures were seeded and grazed, the woodlot was just really heavily thinned and it was replicated. Uh, and this is what we saw in the, in the different treatments. I also had different, uh, you can see in the, the A, B, C, D, E, F here. These are different types of forage. Um, so with those, I see the different forages and um, you can see some of the, the cost here of seeding, the labor of it, which was just broadcast seeded, the production and the production was, I just compared forage production to what it would cost to buy equivalent amount of hay. Um, and then total forage production and net present value. Really some of the forages didn't do well. The ones that did well, um, especially net present values, orchard grass and, and white clover. Um, although I'm not saying that's the best combo, but I, I do think orchard grass really stood out in that, that study as something that was worth planting. Um, internal ret re rate of return or net present value on the whole systems. Um, if I included the initial harvest cost, so it cost me about $500 per acre to have somebody come in and do whole tree logging on this site because it was only seven acres uh, and it was, it was a small research site. And so to move whole tree harvesting up equipment, logging equipment to a small site like that is a cost. And so I, I factored that in. When I factored that in, uh, doing nothing, letting the trees grow out until maturity and then, man, then harvesting them for timber uh, led to the, the greatest internal rate of return. And then silvopasture was the next. And what's interesting about this is silvopasture produced a similar internal rate of return to, doing, to just letting the trees grow to, to maturity. Um, even when I included $500 per acre to establish it. Open pasture didn't nearly stack up because there wasn't that benefit of having a tree crop into the future. Um, when I didn't include the harvest establishment cost, meaning I didn't pay the loggers to cut the trees. So let's say I did 50 acres and then the loggers would have come in and, and done it for free or, or even paid me to do it um, because of the economies of scale. Uh, Silvo pasture still came out on top or, or you know at the top and then uh, open pasture was, was right behind it. And these, these rates of return were nice and high because um, I was comparing it to buying hay and you have annual returns. And so there's a lot of value in those annual returns. Now I didn't get into livestock costs here. This was just looking at feed value, um, not value added beef sales. Here's, a, here's what the site looks like October, 2012. Uh, a couple months after treatment, you can see the strip of orchard grass in the middle. You can see a lot of slash on the ground. This is all the limbs. Well, the next year, that, that slash, a lot of it had already broken down. Some of it had been covered by forages um, that had established. 2014, you see it, and then 2017, you see it again. So this was a, this was a viable system. It worked well. Um, there were some things, lessons learned in it, for sure. But, um, you know, with, with, the, amount, the right grazing pressure, this became successful. And the way I grazed this was grazed it two to three times over the period, over the course of a summer for two to three days at a time. Um, I don't suggest stumping a forest if you're gonna convert a forest to a silvo pasture. You know, when you get in there, first, it's expensive. Second, you're gonna pull up the roots of your residual trees when you go to pull those stumps in addition to having a track machine tearing everything up. So while it may look nice, um, it's really gonna do a lot of damage to your residual trees um, if you go in and stump it. Uh, forage establishment, right after you do that logging operation or, or brush clearing or whatever you're doing, seed some forages in there. Um, if you wanna know what to seed, the easiest thing to do is go to a current pasture, go to the edge of that pasture and see what your better forages are doing best in that that partial shade area along the edge of your pasture. My guess is you're gonna have some orchard grass in there somewhere. 
But uh, you know what, where you all are, you may have some different grasses that go see what's there. That's a good spot to look. Um, and then, you know, planting trees in open pastures or regenerating established silvopastures, pastures, this is totally possible. Uh, what you need to do is you need to come up with some sort of systems. I like linear straight rows of trees with some type. This is, this is my farm down here in, in an orchard I'm planting. So it'll be an orchard silvo pasture. Um, the fruit, young first year fruit trees are protected by tree tubes and a strand of polywire, hot polywire, electrified. Um, and because the cattle are only in there for a day, they eat all the good grass, they eat the other stuff, um, and then they move them on, right? So the animals know the system um, and I'm not leaving them in there long enough that they get bored or they run out of good food and then they start pushing their limits and killing my trees. So the whole point of what I'm trying to tell you all is instead of this feedlot with trees situation, which is in my opinion, very, very common. Um, and based on the census of agriculture seems to be very, very common. I think it's really important that we provide some management recommendations for these. And, and that I think a good management recommendation is, is silvopasture. But we really need the fourth component of silvopasture to do that. And that's farmers managing the system. Because in this system, farmers aren't managing it well. Farmers are putting animals in there because it's functional for the, for the farmer to do but it's not managing the system with trees and forages and animals. And so that fourth component of, of silvopastures is people, is farmers, and you have to manage it and you have to think about what's going on in terms of the competition dynamics of my trees and my livestock and my forage. So I'll stop it there um, and hope we still, yeah, we still have some time for questions. Yeah, thanks, Joe, appreciate it. Um, I will, in the interest of time, I'll jump right into the Q and A. Um, I'll jump to the Q&A box first. We've got some questions in both chat boxes here. Um, one question here is uh, from a person who's running a small urban plot, no animals yet. Do you think silvopasture is scalable for a small setting? If not, are there other agroforestry systems or a la carte practices that can be easily implemented at a small scale? I can, I can go first. Um... I think so. Um, the caveat being that I don't think this has been studied well economically. So based on the information that I have and my hypotheses of how a well-managed civil pasture system can go, I think small scale civil pasture is probably more appropriate um, in backyard and urban settings. And, and, and a part of it has to do with that synergy and um, almost that multiplier effect of where that value is coming from. In, in urban settings, you have to import a lot of feed resources to manage your livestock, particularly as, as we're talking about larger animals. If you're sticking with chickens or um, rabbits or like much smaller animals, then you can, you can, obviously it's not quite as intense, but providing a silvopasture system that's designed to not only provide like shade and habitat, but also forage um, or fodder for your livestock. I think that's a really very scalable option on a small scale. Alternatively, um, say you have like a peri-urban system where you have five acres, sticking with small livestock like sheep or goats and growing like fruit trees or, or something that's a little bit more, has, has an additional revenue source other than just providing fodder, I also think is a very scalable option. In general, you're always gonna run into um, this economies of scale problem when for regardless of what you do on a small farm, small farms struggle with that high cost of overhead compared to the relative rate of return. I don't think a civil pasture would be any different. And I wouldn't say that I have enough information to say that it's better, but I definitely think that management wise, you're gonna see benefits from having an integrated system um, just management wise, I think that civil pasture can alleviate some challenges that you would normally see in an unintegrated system. Um, those, that's my, that's my initial thought. Yeah, I'll jump out. I mean, actually, I think you hit it right on the head. One thing I'll say, if you're on a small scale um, and, and trying to practice civil pasture, even just great, even just pasturing animals, trees or not, um, you really need to think about how much land you have and how much pasture is going to support those animals. You know, if you have an acre of land and you have five beef cattle or even five goats on an acre, you might have an issue with not having enough that that pasture can produce. And you might be very tempted just to like 
really push that pasture hard and fence them in and leave them in there all the time. And I would caution you against that. I think that's what a lot of people do. Um, I would say make a sacrifice area, make a barn. I mean, I know this sounds strange, but you don't have a lot of areas, make a barn, clean it out, feed your animals in there, compost it, sell the compost because you're buying in the hay anyway or the feed. And then periodically graze your animals through your silvo pasture and then take them off of it. Because that's what you need to do in any sustainable grazing system is graze it and then let it recover. And in that small scale, it's really tempting not to let it recover because you don't have anywhere else to put them. So, so I think you can do it, but you got to think about that grazing dynamic. Great, thanks. I'm going to jump over to the chat box and combine a couple of questions. There were two questions, one about um, protecting, um, you know, maintaining native plant communities. I'm guessing particularly in the understory, I think is what's what, what they're driving at there. And then also what's happening to um, biodiversity and like the soil mycorrhizal networks is another question. I think those two kind of go uh, hand in hand a little bit. So I can take a stab at that. Um, you know, if you're converting a forest to a silvo pasture, you're taking like a closed canopy, healthy functioning forest, you're taking it from a really very natural system and putting it into an agricultural system, which means your biodiversity is going to change. I'm not going to say it's going to go up or down because how many grasses are going to be there when you start giving it more light versus how many native understory plants, so much of that is depending. And also the number of species that is the amount of biodiversity um, may not be what the best factor for environmental health, right? You could have a whole bunch of invasive species come in that increase the, the um, short-term biodiversity and that's not gonna be a good thing over the long-term. So, um, so I, I'd say I, I'm not, you know, I'd be cautious about that. The mycorrhizal relationships, we don't have a great gauge on, um, but keep in mind mycorrhizae do not just interact with trees. Mycorrhizal fungi also interact with forages and grassland plants. Um, so it may not be that you're just killing all the fungi. It may be that you're shifting the, the ecosystem to a different type of dominant. Yeah, and then birds and all that other biodiversity, you gotta look at the landscape scale of what's going on. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in because I saw a couple other questions sort of related to this about um, establishing or not establishing on a native prairie. And I think one of the things that um, we sort of danced around but didn't explicitly say is in deciding where and how to build your civil pasture, looking at the site that you're starting from from an ecological perspective is very, very important. There are some places where it's definitely not suitable. I would argue, yeah, don't touch your native prairie. Um, <laughs> the idea behind this is to sort of take take spaces where you can enhance it and optimize the production and optimize the system as a whole. Old growth forests, um, places that really, like Joe said, have a very stable ecological system, but can't necessarily be improved on that, I would not take those spaces. And, and kind of going back to that first question, um, a lot of this is, is really working with what you have. Sometimes what you want won't necessarily fit with what you have available. I think one of the best anecdotes that I heard was a, a, a family that moved up from Texas. They bought land in Southern Missouri. They were gonna graze cattle and uh, they were gonna graze cattle on um, orchard grass and they had Cerecia lespedeza all over their fields. And that's not a great forage for cattle but goats love it. Like they will just go nuts and so they move they bought all this land and moved from texas to be cattle ranchers and now they're goat farmers <laughs> and i think that's that's a great really good example of sometimes your land and your resources will sh should dictate kind of the direction that you go and it's important to listen to that because if you try to push in a direction that your 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 resources really aren't able to hold they don't have the capacity for then you start getting into some challenges and it'll just continue to not work in your favor. Great, thank you. Okay, and then I've, here's one uh, comment followed by a question. Um, what you've been describing is extracting indigenous knowledge and making occupation of native land even more sustainable and profitable. How can non-native landowners integrate land rematriation or return and reparations as they benefit from agroforestry uh, or silvopasture? Really good question. 
comment? Yeah, that is an excellent question. And that's a, it's a topic that I feel pretty strongly about. And um, I, I think it's important to preface my response with the fact that I'm providing this information based on what I have learned and researched about agroforestry and civil pasture through my understanding and putting it in um, a modern context of understanding indigenous practices. I am not an indigenous person. My voice representing these as indigenous practices is not an indigenous voice, it's a colonial voice. And so I would continue the best way to do that, understanding that this conversation does center around a non-indigenous voice, keep seeking out those indigenous community people who have um, who have their roots still in this type of land management. So um, I know, especially out West, um, indigenous burning is really, I think, coming to the foresight, forefront, if maybe this is just because I'm seeing it more, but Frank Lake, Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, Rowan White, those are great indigenous voices in the sustainable agriculture land management scene um, who are sort of in both of these worlds. They are indigenous voices and they are speaking to managing the land with um, their practices and how we can incorporate that and start listening to them. So I, I, would, I would say that um, acknowledging that I'm just trying to amplify <laughs> and I hope that as we, as we learn and, and try to incorporate civil pasture practices on our spaces, recognizing that for a lot of us here, particularly in the Midwest um, and the Ozark region, how this land has been managed before, we need to honor that and, and continue seeking out voices that will that really aren't here right now. And, and knowing that, that they're not here talking in this, in this room, you know, um, is, is important. I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's, that's, those are my feelings on it. I can give my perspective on that too. I think I did a good job. Um, you know, I think, I think civil pasture is more difficult for me because, because really we're talking about raising ungulates really like in heavily managed right? Different than, than wild ungulates, which native people still manage in a lot of ways. Um, very different than something like forest farming, right? Where if you're, if you're thinking about growing medicinal herbal plants, I mean, indigenous knowledge may very, may very well be the knowledge that even can tell you what's medicinal and herbal, not to mention how to grow it. So I think in agroforestry, it, it does depend on the practice as well. You know, when I think about on a, on a like a personal farm ownership land. So not necessarily landscape, but like a personal farm ownership. I'm gonna practice silvopasture here. I think about this on my own farm. Um, you know, I think about what can I learn from the people who have been part of this land before? How can that inform me on how I'm gonna care for this land into the future? Because I'm gonna manage it differently than the people who were here before, whether they were colonists, Native Americans, all of those people were here on this land. Um, and I would say that the agricultural period that came through colonization did a lot of destruction um, that you didn't see when the native people were managing it um, and left a lot of things that, that I really need to, my, my own personal farm, I need to fix. So for me, it's not about bringing it back to native indigenous land use. It's about respecting that by respecting the land. And so to me, I'm not trying to create an indigenous practice. What I'm trying to do is make the land better for the next person who will steward it. Um, and I, in my values, I think that is the, the um, most respectful thing I could do to people who managed the land in the past. And, and, and learn from indigenous communities that are here today, still managing lands and, and that, that localized knowledge. Great, thank you. Um, okay, what is your go-to foundational text for someone wanting to educate themselves on the principles of civil pasture before making the investment and hiring a consultant? Asha, you may have thoughts on this. I mean, Steve Gabriel put out a, a book on civil pasture. Um, I think Chelsea Green published it. It's a good book. It's a good intro book. Um, I mean, I think people need to get out and see civil pastures. So in my opinion, you want to learn how to manage a silvo pasture, um, first, become a great grazer. That's your first step, because you can't do it if you don't know how to graze. So you don't need a book on silvo pasture, you need a book on pasture management. 
Um, and second, get out to farms. See who's grazing well, reach out to extension, find out who's, who's doing the best grazing and go see what they're doing. I, I would also add that, um, agree, I agree. I think Steve Gabriel's book is a really good starter text and I think probably the most comprehensive one that's available out there. There's a lot of online resources as well. Um, but if you're looking for a book to support, I would I would say that that his is probably probably the most comprehensive for someone just getting started. Okay, another question, and this one's particularly pertinent to some of the work we're doing with Oak Savannah restoration. Is there ecological and carbon sequestration value to removing buckthorn and establishing a silvopasture under mature oaks? Mimicking an oak savanna, but with forage species um, other than native species. I mean, I'll take a stab. Actually, I don't know. Um, that's a tough one, right? And so the carbon dynamics there are going to be tough. You got to wonder: is is your are your forages going to produce more carbon or store more carbon in their roots than your buckthorn? Um, I mean, there is an argument that the buckthorn is not producing any food for people and therefore converting that to pasture could, could help, you know, in terms of a leakage and carbon not coming from, or uh, meat, not protein, not coming from tilled lands. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, are you, are you pulling a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere by doing that? My guess is you're probably not making much of a difference one way, one way or the other in terms of that decision. Like you're not going to, see a huge boost one way or the other. Um, but I do think there's a value long-term in that forest because now you're making it financially viable for you as a farmer to be utilizing it and maybe an incentive for somebody to keep growing trees on it in a system where if buckthorn's really, really dominant in the understory, your oaks probably aren't gonna replace themselves. And so if you have a heavy landscape level disturbance, your forest is gonna be in a difficult situation in terms of restructuring. And which is a long-term carbon issue. Yeah, I would I would add that um, although I mean I'm not as familiar with buckthorn, I'm still learning um, a lot of species and, and the challenges for every specific location. Um, I, I guess what I'll what I'll add, I, I agree, Joe, I think it is kind of a really difficult thing to nail down. Um, and ultimately, the, the, the point that I want to add on this is that I don't know if I have an answer, but just to keep in mind that these systems, particularly if you establish in a woodland and do this woodland silvopasture, it's, it's a continuum, it's a dynamic that constantly requires monitoring and management. And, and again, almost thinking back to this, this, this idea of in, rooted in, in indigenous learning and practices, we got to keep learning from our land that we are tasked with um, having a relationship with. And so I think what you do annually will change to have a different outcome. There's not going to be one specific standard annual set of practices that you end up sticking to necessarily every calendar year that are more common in traditional um, or at least conventional agricultural systems. You're probably going to have to modify it as time goes on where you see that a particular species responds really really well to the canopy opening up and it might not be in the long term one that you want to keep encouraging beyond like a specific threshold so that changes your management of it over a five-year period if that makes sense so um I don't, I don't know i'm not sure that necessarily answers that specific question but but i think more applicably for, for each species and each type of forage and plant and tree that you incorporate in your system, it's gonna be an ongoing dynamic and it's gonna change and it's gonna develop over time. Okay, I have a question, um, I guess a kind of a two-part question, but <clears throat> based on your work and your understanding of the body of knowledge on silver pasture, particularly with, with looking at actual hard data, what, what, where do you see the greatest need um, for further data collection on these systems and and or what is 
hopefully in, in, in the near future research for yourselves. Can I, can I go first? I, I'm going to need to step off at right after I go. Yes, I'm, yes, I'm please. teaching a class in a, in a minute or two. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, one of the, one of the really important ways to go is how to get people to start going on it. I mean, there's a, there's an initial startup cost on silvopasture. And so I'd, I'd really like to see some more work on, on how we can get people to get that initial startup cost. And then one of the barriers is, is just thinking about the, the yield and the production benefits of it. And so I'd really like to, um, I'd really like to see some work on this, this moisture dynamic and forage availability at certain times of the year. Cause I think about silvopasture as a tool it's, you know, it's, we're not sure when Williams, we're not trying to cover the earth with it, right? It's a, it's a part, it's a tool within a farming system, just like a, not all of your land is going to be a barn, right? Um, so I, I think that those aspects of it would be really important. And actually, I'm psyched to see Ashley and her role over there, and I'd love to collaborate on some research in the future. Right now, I'm working on um, quantifying the carbon storage in silvopastures. Uh, compared to treeless pastures, not forest conversion stuff, but like trees that were planted in pasture compared to a treeless pasture. Because I think carbon-wise, that's where we get the most bang for our buck. So we're working on that. Um, what was the other part of the question? Did I cover it all? I think you covered. Yep, that's it. Thanks. I'm gonna. I'm yeah, gonna I understand. You got a class. Thanks I got to so teach. Much. Thank you hope, for having hope to me. See you virtually or in person in the future. Yep. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Jim. Take care. Um. So I'll. Um, my answer to this particular question is probably biased by my background, but I think one of the things that's really lacking in the literature is, is livestock performance data. So oftentimes, just because of the very nature of civil pasture and agroforestry systems in general, um, you plant these trees in, in very small spaces. So you have maybe an acre or two acres of, of, a, of a timber stand or a tree stand. Um, you know, for, for a farmer that might be okay to, to work with, but when you're doing replicated research, you, you, get, you need a little more space, particularly for cattle. And so it, it becomes logistically for research, a, a challenge and a cost that I don't think people have um, been able to really overcome yet. Um, just because the low hanging fruit ends up being very small pieces of the system and very small fo focuses of of how the dynamic works. So really what's missing is, is large scale, comprehensive systems wide studies that look at all aspects of the system together, including tree growth and performance, forage growth and performance, soil moisture, soil health, uh, water, and livestock. <laughs> and, um, that ends up being a really ambitious um, missive because and I think that's one that I'm looking forward to because very few positions out there in, in the academic world are charged with just studying civil pasture. So that's why my job is, is really exciting and I think is somewhat unique in that regard because that, that is what I'm researching. And so I have the ability to really go all in and, and that's what I'm doing. So I have a uh, couple of projects that I can look at sort of on a smaller scale and individual scale looking at, you know, just the forage or just the trees. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also developing really sort of large scale comprehensive studies to look at the system as a whole. Um, we'll see how it turns out. <laughs> but that's that's what I'm working on right now to sort of fill that gap. Yeah, so so that sounds like um, pretty, pretty large research projects. And, and I my sense is that comes with a, a lot of a lot of dollars required behind it to fund that. So where typically do you go to look for funding for research at that scale? And what can citizens do to, to maybe help improve the budget for civil pasture research? Yeah, so um, shameless shout out to SARE, uh, specifically the North Central region. Um, I did get a grant funded uh, to start this particular civil project that I'm talking about through a research and education grant. Um, and and, and I, I've worked with Sarah in the past and they're absolutely phenomenal. Um, and they do, there, there is a strong interest in promoting and really understanding more and funding civil pasture research. Um, there, I think there's, there's other opportunities available. Um, from a participant perspective, what I would, what would help me is um, offering um, 
collaborations and opportunities for on-farm research because a lot of grants, including SARE, um, but other agent funding agencies really, um, they look for uh, either matches. Um, so that can be a match financially or you can match labor and resources. And if you're an on-farm partner or a collaborating organization, you can match your labor, you can match your space and, and that counts as a financial match, a resource match, which opens up a lot more funding opportunities. Yeah, SARE is the Sustainable Agriculture and Research Education. Um, and in, in addition to that, it, it also offers opportunity for educator outreach, for extension opportunities. Um, and that's something that a lot of funding agencies really, really like to see. And, and honestly, that's, you know, when I'm looking for projects, I want to do research that that's applicable that people actually have questions about that that farmers will be able to use so i i think um being able to collaborate with with producers with farmers with organizations that that really helps design and shift the direction to be really applicable and keep it rooted in reality if i'm being honest <laughs> it's so easy to get caught up in the in the nitpicky more more academic details of it um when really you know what i hear from producers is just you know how much is this going to cost me or how do i cut down these trees <laughs> and you know it's 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 a good opportunity to, to sit there and be like well you just thin your trees you know i don't know if anybody <laughs> there's there's yeah. a really good really good show you just fold in the cheese right um when the practicalities of the matter i think still there's there's unanswered questions you know how do i go about doing this as as a landowner as a livestock producer as a tree manager um, et cetera, so. Right, yeah, and that seems like that, that type of collaboration and information transfer is something that I'd say SFA is uniquely situated for, at least for within the state of Minnesota. So yeah, absolutely. Another shameless, shameless plug for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I see we're pretty much at the end of our time. So I just, I wanna thank you again, Dr. Conway, and also to uh, Dr. Ori Fiche, who's stepped off here um, for presenting today and, and helping us continue our conversation on our, our path to exploring and uh, adopting and expanding the use of civil pasture in Minnesota. And um, yeah, thanks again to the audience uh, for coming out for the kickoff webinar for the annual conference. Hope to see you later in the week. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity.